So I'm going to Kairos. I'm going to re be recording this lecture over Unit 5, which is consciousness. Uh, so take out your term sheet, and the numbers that we're going to be going over are 225 through, through 265. 225 through 265. But the first part, it's, this, so this unit's basically just sleep and dreams. Or sorry, sleep and um, drugs. Two ways that you can change consciousness. So the unit's about consciousness, which is... Uh, defined in the book as our awareness of ourselves and our environment. So our awareness, something that humans have that other things don't have. And uh, if you look here above above my picture, I have the um, the list of what we're going to do just in this half of the unit, which is sleep. Uh, and in this half of the unit would go from terms about 225 to um, 246, all the way through latent content. I'm just going to walk through that, and that's all I'll do in this part. <clears throat> but first, take out your term sheet. If you don't have that, you can go to the website, agenhammer.com, and then just click on Quizlet Terms and Definitions. But also, if you go to a AP Psych, the drop down there, and then go to Consciousness, it'll bring this up, and there's not much there, except that I'm going to link the YouTube for this, uh, which doesn't yet exist. But I'll link that there. So, like I said, Consciousness is um, our awareness of ourselves and our environment, which humans have, other people don't have. And one way we can change that up is with sleep, which is what we're talking about now. Circadian rhythm is our natural sleep-wake cycle. It happens on a, 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 roughly a 24-hour cycle, of course, but not quite. So there's this study, this guy, Michael Siff, I don't exactly know how to say his name, but in the 1960s, he did this experiment of himself. He was a guy that just enjoyed caving, and so he went actually in a glacier and went underneath for... Um, for some number of months by himself uh, and he saw and he later did it in 1970s in Texas but he, he saw that that uh, the reason they chose a cave was because you can't tell any temperature inside of a cave because you're deep enough that the the outside temperature doesn't change when you're in the cave and then also obviously you have no light so he just went to sleep whenever he wanted to go to sleep, and he woke up whenever he wanted to wake up. But when he would wake up, in the 1970s at least, he would call his research team, uh, and then they would document when he woke up and when he went to sleep. And they found that he actually went to sleep roughly on a 24-hour cycle as well, even though he didn't have the sun to be guiding him. But it was actually a little bit different. So he went to sleep on about a 24-and-a-half-hour cycle, just a little bit over 24. So... Uh, in about 24 and a half hours, he would have gone through a full sleep-wake cycle, which is part of why during the, the week, during the weekends, you sleep in later than the weekday, because on the weekdays, you're sleeping on a 24-hour cycle, and then when you get to the weekends, the, the half hour, which apparently is the 24 and a half, is the actual natural human sleep-wake cycle, at least according to this guy. Then those, the half hour from each of the five days during the week, um, is sort of your sleep debt that you've acquired, plus however you're let you're staying up and not sleeping. But so you basically acquired a two and a half hour sleep debt, according to the study, during the weekdays that you then make up in the weekends. But roughly speaking, our circadian rhythm um, is on a 24 hour cycle. Suprachiasmic nucleus is a part of the brain right here. It's a little rice sized piece of your brain that produces melatonin. And melatonin is the natural chemical that, that, that uh, it's like your, your mind's um, built-in sleep drug. It l l regulates sleep, lets you, go to, lets you go to sleep. If you take an EEG of when you're going to sleep, so when there's uh, several different types of waves, so there's, uh, which is what I'm talking about right here, in sleep stages. So there's, when you're awake, you have alpha waves. So all of you right now have alpha waves unless you're asleep which are these uh, sharp little rigid waves, EEG readings. Then you go, the first stage of sleep is stage one, second stage of sleep is stage two, then stage three, stage four. Pretty easy. And then REM, which stands for rapid eye movement sleep. Um, so alpha waves, you, you gradually get deeper and deeper and deeper into sleep until REM sleep, and REM sleep is also called paradoxical sleep because it's the deepest sleep and it's actually the most recovering of sleep and it's also the one where you dream, so REM is dreaming sleep. Um, but it's also the one that looks most similar to alpha waves. So you're actually physiologically the most awake when you're dreaming. So your body temperature rises back to um, your awake levels. Um, and and the, the brain waves themselves look the most like sleep. There's some characteristics 
uh, of each of the waves. So alpha waves are awake waves. Stage two waves have what's called sleep spindles. We don't care about theta waves in this class, but stage two waves have sleep spindles. And that's these, these bursts of activity in stage two. And then stage three and four, specifically stage four, but stage three and four have what's called delta waves, which are these slow lethargic waves, uh, which is the deepest sleep. So your body temperature goes the lowest during the sleep. And it's, so if you've ever tried to wake someone up while they're asleep, and they're really hard to wake up, like you nudge them and they, they just won't wake up, that's probably because they're in stage three or four sleep, which is delta waves. So if, or if you wake someone up and they have, they are really hard to, to wake up, they're, they're hard to know what's going on and all that, they're probably in stage three or four. REM, if you so wake someone up out of REM, um, it's relatively easy to wake someone up out of, out of sleeping, dreaming sleep. Um, hallucinations. So there's two types of sleep hallucinations. There's um, hallucinating as you're going to sleep is called hypnagogic hallucinations, and hallucinating as you're waking up is called hypnopompic hallucinations. So it's the way I remember it is hypnagogic G going to sleep. So hallucinations between alpha waves and stage one, hypnagogic hallucinations, and hallucinations as you're naturally waking up would be hypnopompic hallucinations. There's a little bit of a difference there. Uh, hypnagogic hallucinations tend to be more general and vague. There's three main types of hypnagogic hallucinations that people typically see. Um, and usually in a class I'll have maybe one person that'll say they actually have these or two people. So some of you might have these, but hypnagogic hallucinations, you often feel like there's a big weight being like, pushing you into your bed. So you feel like you're being pushed into your bed through a, a large weight, and that's a hypnagogic hallucination, like a tactile hallucination almost. Um, another thing with hypnagogic hallucinations is you tend to see just these vague figures as opposed to hypnopompic when you're waking up. You'll see more vivid things. You'll see actual things in your room. But hypnagogic hallucinations, you'll see like a dark shadowy figure above you. Um, and non-surprising, so we know now that these are hypnagogic hallucinations and we know exactly how they work, but uh, if you lived a long time ago or you didn't know that, you'd, you'd be likely to think that you were possessed by demons or something like that, which would make sense if you didn't know what those hallucinations were. Hypnopompic hallucinations, I have several friends that have had those. I've never had them, but can be very scary. Well, both are very scary, or can be. So my brother went to Oklahoma Baptist like I did, and he was he had a bunk bed in the dorms, and um, he would hallucinate that there was a giant spider, like a dinner plate sized spider that was right above his bed and he was only uh, two feet from the from the ceiling and so he would hallucinate this spider and then he'd jump out of the bed he's as afraid of the spiders as I am but um, so he would uh, and hallucinations are, are just as real as as you actually seeing something so he literally basically saw a spider uh, several mornings as, as hypnopompic hallucinations um, I have a f I have a friend Actually, my best friend. My best friend has a common hypnopompic hallucination. He sees a little girl in the corner of his room. He's seen it since elementary school. He sees a little girl in his room in a white dress. And he says it's terrifying, which is not, not surprising. But he sees a little girl in his room, and it's really scary. And he'll, he'll wake up from sleep, and then she'll be there. And he'll hide under the covers and, <laughs> until he falls back asleep. I had a, um, one of my college professors sees a or I don't know if he sees or just saw once, but he saw a wolf, but it wasn't a normal sized wolf. It was a wolf that, that was about 10 feet tall. It took up the whole room. And all these things that I'm saying, hypnopompic hallucinations, are just as vivid as if you're actually seeing the thing. Because um, you're, us actually seeing something is, is not us seeing it with our eyes as much as it is with our brain. So our brain is actually the thing projecting what you're seeing in the first place. And our brain tells us then that there's a little girl in the room or a wolf or whatever. So it's just as, uh, just as real as if you're actually seeing it. So that's hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations. <clears throat> um, I'll skip down to night terrors because it's sort of in the same line. Night terrors is a specific type of nightmare. So nightmares is something that adults can have. Night terrors is mostly only something children have. And night nightmares or even dreams are typically have like a storyline uh, and have, you, you could sort of describe it later on. Night terrors generally only happen with children, and there's not really a storyline. It's just like this strong emotional feeling. And um, 
So, and it's sort of similar to hypnagogic hallucinations. It would be like a, a dark, shadowy figure. So, like there's a, there's like a demon attacking you, um, and it's just this terrifying thing. And ironically, it only happens to little children. So most of the time, it only happens to little children. So they'll wake up screaming. Uh, some of them have it, some of them don't. I'm sure in in one of my classes, I'm sure three or four people have had night terrors or know someone that does. Um, so REM, REM sleep is rapid eye movement sleep. So if someone was sleeping and you were to peel their eye open as they're sleeping, you would actually see their eye jolting around. And you can look up YouTube videos of that. But In REM sleep is a super creative name for all the stages that are not REM in sleep. So stage one, two, three, four are all in REM sleep, which just means non-REM. It's a silly name for that, but that's what they called it, in REM sleep. Insomnia, you probably know what insomnia is. That's the inability to sleep. Um, so some of you have probably dealt with insomnia, but just inability to sleep. Narcolepsy is the opposite. So that's people that sleep, uh, it's sleeping too much. So you fall asleep just randomly during the day. And funny enough, it can often be triggered because of excitement. So you can get too excited and then you fall asleep. So like if you're at, at a, uh, someone scares you, someone come, jumps up behind you and scares you and you just fall asleep. But I have a video here of a narcoleptic dog. Uh, we'll watch this and then, and then I'll come back. Let's see, let me bring myself out. And the notepad. Here we go. He gives new meaning to the phrase dog tired, the narcoleptic poodle who falls asleep at the drop of a hat. Paul Boyd reports the pounce out pooch is something of a medical mystery. Skeeter is a small dog with a very big problem. No matter how much he struggles to stay awake, he can't. For this 11 pound toy poodle, almost every moment is a disturbing losing battle with the urge to sleep. There he goes, out cold. Skeeter has narcolepsy, an uncontrollable urge to sleep. Skeeter's struggles to stay awake are heartbreaking for his family, the Hendersons of Chubbuck, Idaho. His narcolepsy is triggered by excitement, so he can be out for an afternoon walk and just fall asleep sitting up. There you go. Come on. You can do it. The tail wagging prospect of jumping up on Shari Henderson's lap suddenly sets Skeeter snoozing. Come on. Oh. He's miserable. He looked like he was a prisoner in his body. He was like, please help me. You know, I'm trapped in this little furry white shell. When the Henderson's grandson comes to play, Skeeter plays dead. Strangely, when Skeeter can be kept calm, that's when he seems able to stay alert. But nothing's more exciting for a dog than food. So to keep him awake long enough to eat, he has to be constantly petted and stroked. Otherwise, he's off in mid-bite. I was just stunned that uh, I had a narcoleptic dog in, in my hospital. Skeeter's condition is so rare and so little is known about doggy narcolepsy that America's top vets are studying this home video of his symptoms. It's not particularly unpleasant for the dog, except that he can't live a normal life. Uh, he just cannot be a dog. He's being treated with antidepressants designed for humans. But so far, well, watch for yourself. In the beginning, the excitement over food would put Skeeter to sleep, but then he got worse, and now just about any kind of excitement puts him under. Later in the show, we'll meet another dog who is known as the world's tallest dog. <laughs> All right, cool. So that's narcoleptic poodle. Uh, let's see. Yeah, and the only thing that left is dreams. So dreams. <clears throat> Freud cared a lot about dreams, and he, he used to use dreams. And we'll talk about Freud in a later unit. But Freud used to use dreams as a projective test. So Freud was really c concerned about the unconscious, and one of the ways to get at the unconscious was your dreams, because he thought that you projected your unconscious thoughts and your dreams, which you sort of do. He had uh, two words to describe the, the content in the dreams, manifest content and latent content. Manifest content is the actual stuff in the dreams, so it's the actual remembered storyline of the dreams. So like if you're dreaming about um, being chased by the police, that would be the manifest content. The latent content is the supposed meaning behind the dreams, or your 
the the unconsciousness that you're projecting into the dreams, your unconscious thoughts and uh, emotions. So if you're being chased by the police, that would be the manifest content. But the latent content might be that um, you're projecting your your uh, anxieties and desire and your whatever, your your fear of being caught about something. So that would be the latent content. But he went really far with that, uh, saying that dreams specifically meant something and that Actually, that's what his, his main book is the interpretation of dreams. And he, he um, each type of dream, he'd say, meant a certain thing, and he went very literal with what exactly. If you dreamed about a staircase, it meant this, and if you dreamed about um, falling, it meant this, or losing your teeth, it meant this, and that, that sort of thing. Lucid dreaming is a, it has nothing to do with Freud, but it's, it's a type of dreaming where you can control your dreams. There's a way that you can induce lucid dreaming, um... And mostly it is you uh, will do something. You'll need to get into a habit. Um, well, first of all, so lucid dreaming is where you can control your dream. So in a lucid dream, if you're dreaming about flying or whatever, then you come to the realization that you are dreaming, and then you can control what you do in your dream. And you can do that on purpose. And the way you do that is while you're awake, you'll need to get into a habit of doing something uh, to remind yourself that awake, it's sort of like the movie Inception, but um, so you'll want to count while you're awake, you'll count one, two, three, four, five, and do that every 20 minutes or so, so that you just get into the habit of counting. Uh, and then if you're dreaming, it'll look different. So instead of having five fingers, maybe you'll have six fingers, and so you'll look at your sixth finger and you say, All right, well, uh, this is, I must be dreaming. Or you look at uh, what another way to do it is look at the clock. Um, look at the clock two times in about five seconds. So look at the clock, look down, look at the clock again. And if the time is the same, then you're awake. But if you get into the habit of doing that, then you're also going to do it in your dream. And if, if you do it in your dream, then it's going to be uh, 8.50. And then you'll look back and it'll be 12 o'clock. And so then if the times are different, then you know you're dreaming. And once you come to the realization that you're dreaming inside your dream, then you can control your dream. There's a drawback to that, though, because... If you do that, you can lucid dream, which is cool, or you can enter sleep paralysis, uh, which is where you sort of wake up, but you're still paralyzed, which probably a lot of you have done, and that's really unpleasant because you can then be sort of awake, but literally paralyzed, and you can be hallucinating because that's basically what dreaming is, hallucinating. So you'd be lying on your bed paralyzed and still sort of dreaming, so that could be terrifying. So this is the second half of, of uh, the Unit 5 as well as a couple of things I missed in sleep. So I forgot to talk about sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is another sleep disorder where you um, will stop breathing in your sleep. So you be sleeping and stop breathing and then it'll uh, jerk you awake. It generally only happens with children, but it can happen with anyone. <coughs> and then sleep cycles. Your circadian rhythm happens on that roughly a 24, 24 and a half hour period, but your sleep cycles, you'll cycle through all the stages of sleep um, after roughly 90 minutes. So every hour and a half, you'll cycle all the way through the sleep. And you see it's not exactly 90 minutes, but so when you're first awake, you go into stage one, then stage two, and this it skip stage two, and you can skip some of the stages. But generally speaking, stage one, then stage two, then stage three, then stage four, and then you go back up into REM. And REM is the one that's actually the... the um, the refreshing sleep or the sleep that you really need. In fact, if you're sleep deprived, you'll go straight into REM, <clears throat> which is why if you've ever stayed up really late at night and then you fall asleep, if you ever fall asleep in school because you're, you're uh, really tired, you'll usually notice that you fall asleep and you dream immediately. So ordinarily, you'd only dream after about a little over an hour. You wouldn't dream until that point. But if you're sleep deprived, you go straight into REM. Um, uh, so that's that. But after about every 90 minutes, you go through an entire sleep cycle, and then you go back through the cycle. But as, as you get farther into the night, you'll, you'll go more often into REM, and you, you won't go into as deep of sleep. Um, the sleep cycle. The psychoactive drugs, uh, the drug section. So psychoactive drugs, just a, it's the, not a class of drug. It's just drugs that affect your uh, consciousness. So like Advil would not be a psychoactive drug, 
but anything that actually affected the way that you think and the way that you perceive things would be a psychoactive drug. So all the things here are psychoactive drugs, alcohol and then all the other recreational drugs <coughs> that you would take. We already talked about toler tolerance, withdrawal, and dependence, but I'll, I'll quickly go back over that, but not in as much detail as I did last time. But tolerance is when you need to take more and more of a drug uh, in order to achieve the same effects. So the first time, some drugs have tolerance, some drugs don't have tolerance, some drugs actually have reverse tolerance, um, but alcohol has a lot of tolerance. So the first time you ever drink alcohol, you'll get drunk fast on just a little bit of alcohol, but then as you drink more and more alcohol or an alcoholic, uh, would need to drink a lot of alcohol and, and wouldn't feel nearly the same effects as someone who doesn't drink as much. Which gets dangerous because your LD50 or the, or the lethal dose required to kill you doesn't change, but you need to keep taking more and more of the drug, which means you're inching closer and closer to, to a lethal dose of the drug. Then withdrawal, <coughs> um, and sort of dependence, but withdrawal is... Um, some drugs, so say heroin, once you start taking heroin, then your body's going to deplete your... So your body has the natural uh, regulation of your neurotransmitters mechanism. So once you take heroin or whatever, your body's going to see that you have an excess of whatever neurotransmitter that it's working on. And so your body's going to make less of that neurotransmitter. Um, and so once you stop taking heroin or whatever it is, then you're going to rely on your own level of that neurotransmitter which now is less than it was before you started taking heroin because your body is compensated and so now you have this depletion of your natural neurotransmitters for a few days uh, and that's withdrawal and you'll feel bad although that will go away after a few days but then you can also have the permanent effects paired with the withdrawal physical dependence <coughs> uh, you can get physically dependent on some drugs and psychologically dependent on pretty much anything but physically dependent means, well, basically means you have withdrawal. So if you stop taking the, like, uh, like nicotine or caffeine to a lesser degree, but nicotine. So nicotine, when you smoke cigarettes, uh, you become physically dependent on the cigarettes, meaning that if you stop taking cigarettes, you're going to feel bad and you'll crave those cigarettes to achieve now your normal level of those neurotransmitters. Uh, so basically physical dependence just means that you will have a withdrawal if you stop taking the drug. And so you have these cravings which some, some drugs don't have, although you can become psychologically dependent on pretty much anything. <clears throat> so if, you, if you're addicted, if someone says they're addicted to their phone or they're addicted to Facebook, of course you can't become physically addicted to those things, but you can become psychologically addicted or, or playing video games or whatever. Uh, or even uh, like a boyfriend, girlfriend, you can become psychologically addicted to. Um, which works sort of in a similar way, but obviously you don't literally have withdrawal associated with that. And addict, the, the definition of addiction is uh, the need to continue taking something despite negative consequences. So if you, uh, I don't know, drink alcohol just occasionally, well, of course you can't, you can't do that at all, but if a person drinks alcohol just occasionally, uh, then they may or may not be addicted. But if they drink alcohol, even though um, they're about to get divorced because of alcohol use, then that would be addiction. So the need to, even though it's destroying your marriage, you still drink. Or um, if I, on my lunch break, drink a lot of alcohol, uh, even though there's the risk of me being fired, that would be more into addiction. And then I've left this, this page up the whole time, but this is the class of drugs, and I'm not going to talk much about this. You just need to know, I'll, I'll actually hand this out as a handout, but all you need to know is, is the classes of drugs and uh, which drug falls in each class. <clears throat> um, but depressants are drugs that, that, uh, that, well, like alcohol, which is a depressant, which actually works on GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Meaning, so depressants make your, your um, synapses fire less often. And then stimulants are the opposite. They will uh, make your heart beat faster and all that. But all you need to know is just alcohol depressant, heroin depressant, caffeine stimulant, and so on. So just know which, which uh, drugs fall into which categories. And that's, that is all of Unit 5, short unit. Because this unit's so short, we're actually going to have an open note quiz tomorrow, which is Friday. So tomorrow we'll have an open note, open everything, open uh, Google and open friend and everything quiz because there's just nothing else to do in this unit. It's very short. Uh, and then 
when I get back on Monday, we'll start Unit 7, but that is it.